up, everybody? I'm blessed and free. Welcome back to another episode of DOC TV. So you guys already know, love to bring guests on this channel, especially ones that have been through the ringer, man, been to prison, and then turned around and changed their life and done something positive. And this guest is a perfect example of that. If you haven't, man, go ahead and press that subscribe button. Give this video a thumbs up and drop a comment. So, man, for the people watching at home, uh, why don't you just go ahead and start off with your name and where you're from? My name is Miguel Alisea, uh, other known as Psycho. Okay. Uh, born and raised out of Chicago, Illinois. Uh, moved to uh, Detroit, Michigan. Uh, in my early ages, I was uh, nine years old when I moved, made that transition. Ran with the street gangs. I was a gang member. Um, Grew up in the ranks, uh, became a young enforcer. I actually uh, put it this way, by the age of 14, I was a father. By the age of 17, I had four children and I had caught my uh, first adult case. I was Michigan's most wanted for attempt murder, felony firearm. I had a incident where walked in a bar establishment ran into an enemy of my older brothers. Next thing you know, I was in a shootout. Uh, when it was all said and done, I fled the state. I was a uh, fugitive for a minute. I was placed on Michigan's Most Wanted, where I was uh, eventually apprehended. I entered the state prison system at 17. Came home 35. Damn, bro, that's a, that's a long time to be in prison, man. Definitely, it was... Uh, it was my best, my best years as far as I lost my youth. I had in and outs of juvenile system, but that was the one that where it came to a halt. And I, uh, I grew up in a cell, you can say. Um, that's where I, uh, I grew up to become a real man. You know, uh, as a youth, I rebelled. I came from a broken home environment. My grandparents uh, took me in. I rebelled against that um, and I wrecked havoc on the world. I made the street reputation as a, um, you know, a strong, um, rebellious individual that um, I played the heavy game with the big hitters, young. I was a kid and I learned all my lessons the hard and painful way. Uh, ended up in the system at 17. You know, you don't know what you're up against until you get there. And then it's the big house, man. It's uh, it's definitely a life-changing experience and one that um, taught me to be the man I am today in the sense that uh, in, in, in the positive, the pros and cons, it saved my life. Uh, but it, yet it was the fight of my life. What prison did you end up in when you were 17? Like, where did you go? So here in Michigan, Detroit, Michigan, I ended up in the uh, state adult uh, prison system, which for at 17, I was waived to the, the adult system, yet uh, quarantined for intake. Uh, the original big house is Jackson, Michigan. I ended up in Ionia for the juveniles where um, it's the next, it's called, they call it gladiator school. So I ended up at Michigan Reformatory. All right. Inside the walls. Um, it's a walled prison, five tiers. Uh, you don't see nothing but them walls once you're inside. When you walked into there at 17 years old, what happened? Like, how, how did you get from, you know, being on the street to in prison and like, did you have to do anything like a test of heart where they're going to try you right when you walk in? How does all Definitely. that go up there? Definitely. You know, back in those days, they called it gladiator school. It still recognizes gladiator school because you're going to be tested. And if you didn't hold your own weight, they eat you alive in there. The majority of general population is lifers. And when I say lifers, I went in with uh, just numbers, man. I did... Uh, I went in with a six to 12 year sentence and I ended up doing 18 and a half straight, catching my B prefix on my 10th year. But when I went into that, that world, it was definitely, uh, I'm gonna just be real as it comes, man, it was scary. I mean, the whole environment, you go, the prison looked like a castle and you got all these bars and these, these tiers 
and you got these these guys that got nothing to lose. And it's a dog eat dog world where if you wasn't physically strong, you got eight and alive. You know, today's times from what evolved, if you're not mentally strong, you'll get eaten alive by the system. Back then, if you wasn't in shape, physically strong, recognized by had a crew, I seen it all, man. You got eight and alive in that system. Is it all ran by gangs in there? Are you like clicked up immediately when you walk in and that's who you're riding with? Definitely all gangs. Uh, you got your religious groups, which was, uh, you know, eventually they recognized it as gangs. You got your street gangs. You got your uh, race gangs. Everybody's a click inside. Uh, if you're an individual that wasn't with that, you're either going to click up with somebody or you're going to have a, a hell of a ride uh, establishing yourself as a strong individual. Yeah, in Florida, in, in Florida, it's the same thing, man. Like if you go in and you don't click up with down here, we call that a neutron because you're just neutron. neutral. Yeah. Definitely. So if you're not bumping 1,000, man, and like, you're going to get tried. They're going to try to push up on you and either make oh, you, yeah. you know, ride with that click or, you know, break that shit off type thing. Definitely. Same way down here in Michigan. That's just how it was. I mean, it was raw, man. It was cold-blooded. What I seen inside those walls, I went through the juvenile system, some pretty hard training schools. But when I got to that adult system at 17 and seen that whole world, it was intimidating. I was always a strong individual, athletic in my time. But when I got to the big house, that's where I really put it on. I was nothing. I was a, a street punk in the sense that I was tough, but that place made me a whole nother level of a person that I became what I was to survive it. And that was a straight beast. <laughs> in every sense. Every day was a training. Every day. So what was the biggest thing when you say when you got to adult camp, like things really, you know, took it to another level? How For the people watching at home, what, like, explain what you mean by that. So they're like, because some people watching haven't been to prison. And I mean, I know what you're saying, but they might right. not. So what's that new level that you experienced when you went in there? It was straight gladiator, man. Uh, you know, the click sense. Um, the wars that were going on for years on years, you know, the division, the race wars going on, the, you know, um, the system, you know, now you're up against an administration um, that was also uh, viewed as its own clique, you know, yeah. uh, it's uh, do or die, survival of the fittest, only the strong survive, you know, um, commissary time, if you wasn't a uh, if you didn't have, uh, you know, uh, soldiers out watching your back when you get in that store bag, you know, the vultures were on point and hit, <laughs> you know, <laughs> just for a bar of soap to, you know, keep your hygiene up was, you know, uh, something that you would never think, you know, something so small would be so big to, to you'd have to fight for, you know, yeah. uh, a, a noodle, <laughs> you know, commissary, uh, you know, the hall, the rations. State state meals are just the worst of the worst, you know. And if you didn't have your weight up in there, you got eight and alive. I went in that place, I was 185, but I was bones in the sense I was conditioned. But when uh, I seen all the muscle up in there, that's when it really became, you know, survival. And to, and to gain weight up in there, you got to be blessed to have the, the nutrition, you know, to, to heal the muscles and, and build them to to be somebody that's going to be powerful. And you know that uh, we don't get those supplements and, and all the the additive preservatives, that it's all natural, pure strength up in there. So it's calisthenics, it's mad uh, reps. It's uh, when you got access to a weight pit, you know, uh, becoming uh, uh, a monster in the sense that, man, I lifted weight. I never in my life imagined I would be lifting. I did you know, workouts that the Navy SEALs think that it would be, you know, a walk in the park to do a Navy SEAL routine compared to our prison routine. And every day was a training. You know, four o'clock wake up, you know, 6 a.m. child hall line, back to the wall, coming down in tears, you know, <laughs> um, 
every Saturday you may you might see a, a muffin uh, or a sausage link, and that was maybe twice a month. You know, it was a uh, heavy duty. You know that um, it's a world of its own. It's a uh, it's a uh, man. It was my worst nightmare. So what when you were in there, man? Like looking back now, what was the craziest shit you went through when you were locked up in prison? So I experienced a little bit of everything. My first two years, I fought every day. When I say every day, I fought every day, 365 days a year, uh, 30 days out of the month. I fought every day. When I went in, you know, they call you you, you uh, you're fish, you know, you fresh meat. Um, I turned my laundry in, and when I got my laundry back, back, it was empty. They stole my drawers, man. It was something real. <laughs> Uh, you know, um, hitting that child hall, you know, everybody's eyeballing you, but you, you know, you, you got to keep that straight look. And it's like, uh, you're going to be challenged, you know, rivals. If you were set, you know, a member of a set click, you know, there was wars going on. You get put in the wrong area, the wrong position, the wrong blind spot, you're getting popped, you know, and it's hitting and keep it moving. And I seen it all. And it was like, uh, you got to be sharp, alert on your feet, pins and needles, and uh, and train yourself to be a straight soldier yeah. to survive. So I heard you say in the beginning, like you had a, a prefix, or I heard that you were saying something about that. What exactly is that? So I went in under a prefix. That's your fresh number. I had a six-digit number, 234-752 in MDOC. I received that number coming in through intake quarantine. Uh, and then on my 10th year, I called a uh, prison riot for assault a prison employee where I was uh, ultimately prosecuted, charged with uh, prison riot for assault a prison employee. I received my B prefix you I know, got you. without making it home. You know, uh, yeah. I was on parole my, after my first six years and the parole board just kept slamming me with the maximum flop over. So what happened with the the charge that you caught, which gave you your B B letter essentially? Like, how did that go down with that riot? So what happened was the parole board was basically not going to let me go home. I met every requirement to go home. Um, I learned the system wasn't designed to program to reform or rehabilitate. It's strictly to penalize and punish. It was a uh, abuse of authority in the name of job security. And when you're yeah. strong and recognized as being a strong individual, the administrations, they, they, they red flag you and target you. I was subject to a lot of harassment by guards, shakedowns that were beyond shakedowns, uh, you know, the scrutinizing. I was, you know, always monitored closer than the average uh, inmate to where um, it, be, it just became, uh, I, I bottled up so much that uh, on my 10th year, I was I was maxed out on a six to 12 year sentence. They weren't letting me go home. They restricted me under a, a STG designation, which is a security threat group. They labeled me as a leader uh, with influence. So I was restricted of all um, group uh, activities. I couldn't hit the weight pit. I had to make my own weights. You know, I put my my law books and and reading books in a in the laundry bag, and I curl them. I, you know, roll my mattress up, tied up, and I squat it. You know, I improvise. Um, and what happened was, I was being targeted by the administration. I snapped on a minor situation, turned into a major situation. It was over moving a chair in a day room, and a guard called me out on it. And yet his approach was just totally disrespectful you know, and, and belligerent to where uh, I gave it right back to him as he addressed me, disrespectful, I gave it back. And then that 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 put me, they were gonna put me in segregation. And then I just lost it, man. I I, uh, I went full ape shit on him, man. I started throwing every garbage canister on base at the guards. I took the two microwaves they had on base, um, plugged them and threw them at the guards. And then the next thing you know, it was cold blue uh, lockdown. And uh, four guys, four of my guys stood behind me, and then we had a 45-minute standoff with uh, over 100 guards on base, 
They are uh, dressed in goon squad gear, right gear, batons, gas. Uh, they came at us in 16 minutes. We battled on base. When it was over with, uh, I was charged with uh, four assaults of prison employee, prison riot, where I received uh, three to six more years. And I was placed in uh, level five maximum security and uh, left in the hole for seven years. So you did seven years in confinement? So I did seven years straight in confinement. My first two years, they put me in what they called a disciplinary cell, level five maximum security. I had a shower stall inside my cell, a slab, concrete slab, toilet and sink, and a bolted in foot locker. The windows didn't open. I had two slots on the door. I wasn't allowed outside of that cell for nothing. Uh, two five minute showers per week inside my cell. They would turn the water on on shower day, just enough to let me get wet. And then I would bird bath it the rest of it with the state green lime soap that they gave us. I wasn't allowed commissary, no uh, TV appliances. Every 30 days, I was allowed a five day break in the cages for one hour if I chose to go out with a, a goon squad escort where uh, I, I most of the time I just chose to stay in. Um, they were putting psychotropic meds in my food. I would eat my steak tray. And next thing you know, I would be drowsy and pass out. And that's when I learned that they were, um, they were actually putting meds in my food because I had assaults on staff, serious assaults. One time they, I went 28 days, they didn't feed me. Uh, and that just put me into straight up, I'm seeing the other guys that were similar charges to my offense. They were straight going to war with these guys. And that's when I, I realized that I had to go to war with them as well. And I did. And it got gruesome, man. Uh, the, you know, when you got to uh, gather up your feces and, and make a bomb that we used uh, milk containers that we would keep off that tray. Yeah. And, uh, and go to war with them when that slot open. I stick my arm in that slot and get the cut and loose. Well, I let them know you ain't gonna feed me, but one day you're gonna have to open that slot. And when it did, I took it all extreme and went to war and sent them home with literally shit stains on them, them guards. That was the worst. That uh, after that, they gave me everything I had coming in there. So they was giving me everybody else's food loaf that nobody wanted to eat. I ate it. And I actually stayed strong. I maintained my health inside those seven years, three state meals a day, two showers per week. That was it. Every 30 days, a uh, five day break for one hour in a cage. If I chose to go out. I'm sure you've seen it, man, being back there, like confinement will make people crazy, man. Like they'll Definitely. see shit. Like, did you, what did you do to keep your mind sane when you were back there? Man, you know, I tell you, that was the fight of my life. It was uh, being entombed in, inside a prison. You're, you're isolated to the max. And and how I kept my sanity, we had a stainless steel mirror in the cell. And I would always look into it and catch that blurred vision. And I tell myself, don't give up. I refuse to lose on their terms. You know, they wanted to break me in every sense, mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually. And they did. But I refused to allow them to see what the devastating effects that they were doing to me. So, you know, I faked it, you know, they come by, make the rounds, you know, I was at attention. They make their count rounds, I'm pressing my bump. And when they weren't, I was in that cell exercising. I could do a thousand push-ups in one hour without breaking form. I mean, military, man, it was, uh, you got no, your mind, you're listening to everybody's insanity is blurred and yelled out 24-7. There's no peace. So to keep yeah. your sanity, you almost have to go insane and adapt to that environment. And let me tell you, I'd have neighbors, guys in the fellow cells that bugs, they call them bugs, you know, <laughs> yelling, screaming, flooding, you know, throwing feces, eating their feces, you know, and they no, no sleep like zombies. So then I had to go to mental war with these guys. I remember one time I had to tap a guy out when I say tap. I literally tapped on that, that concrete wall for 72 hours, nonstop. I didn't sleep. My forearms were so swole 
but I bugged the guy out. He couldn't take it. It was a mental breakdown <laughs> where all I wanted was my peace. The guy wouldn't shut up, so I shut him up. But that was insane, you know? I was yeah. exhausted, you know? But I was training myself at the same time to survive the madness. If you ain't gonna shut the fuck up, then I'm gonna shut you the fuck up. And that's how it was, you know, on top of the isolation, you know, um, you don't got anybody to call or talk to, or, you know, if you keep a comment, if you start a conversation with the guys on the rock, it could only last so long. But I recall, man, I would literally talk to my finger, you know, and then I would literally pick a booger and talk to that booger. I had my boogers talking to me, you know, but I would carry conversations like that. And that's how I held on to my sanity. When you get out, man, like, how did that day go? Where did they put you back in GP? Well, when I was released from level five, ASSEG, administrative segregation, the whole, after seven years, level five, they released me to level five population, which is a unit, maybe four or 500 prisoners, single cell bunk. That's the transition to general population. So then you go from that, then they reduce my level to level four security, which is, you know, still a restricted level, but I was a level one prisoner as far as management level, but they called it gradual reduction. And so I had a year left to max out my sentence. So they let me out and the, the process was to, so that I can adapt back to general population because they know on max on my max date i'm gonna be released to society so that's the only reason that they re let me release me from ad seg was the their their attempt to have me adjust back to normal functions where everything had been controlled to the maximum level and how so long I, did it take you to adjust back to that you know i can tell you this for me i always adapted right off rip you know i fell into place and you're going from everything being controlled, you know, and losing that for years on years, those privileges. When they put me back in population, I just follow suit. When they cracked that cell door, I walked the line to child. You know, everything was routine. Everything was scheduled and programmed. I just followed suit as I did in the whole, all the years that I was incarcerated. And then on that day when they released me to home, same thing, man. When I came home, it was March 18, 2009, after 18 and a half years. Everything changed in the world. Yeah. In my first three days home, I recall I didn't sleep, but I was, I was laying in my bedroom at my relative's home, and I was waiting for the lights to be turned off. And that's when I realized, after the whole night with the lights on, that it was up to me to turn off those lights. So adapting to the world, adapting to population, it was just following suit. When I came home, I realized I had to turn them lights off. When I got in the car, I realized I didn't know you had to hit the brake in order to put the car in the gear. But once I got it, bam, the cell phone technology advancements, they didn't have any of that when I went in. They had beepers, VCRs, yeah. tape cassettes. When I come home, cell phones, CDs, DVDs, that was the only adjustment that I had to adapt to, and I picked it up right off hand. So you've been out for, for a while now, man. So uh, what what's going on in your life these days? 12 years I've been home as of March. It'll be 13 years, March 18th this year. Um, cool, man. 13 years, bro. I, I came home with nothing. Uh, lost loved ones I couldn't say goodbye to, you know, um, all my grandparents passed away on me, uh, but yet I've had extended family, relatives. My children grew up, grown adults now, but I just picked it up. My uncle got me into the plant life for a motor company. Uh, and from there, I just excelled. I went to work every day, established myself, uh, got a bank account, got my driver's license, got my social security card, got my birth certificate. Uh, Got my first vehicle, took myself to work every day, worked all the overtime I could get, uh, got my own place, built my own appliances, everything up in my home, uh, stayed working. Uh, two years later, I got an apprenticeship for skilled trades. 
I went from 34,000 a year to 125,000 a year as a lab tech. I was uh, collecting the samples in the paint shop. I ran what they called the paint kitchen. I'd collect the material samples, do a chemistry test, log it. Man, my life changed to where you would never in a million years knew that I went away that long. Yeah. Uh, my, my education, you know, I got my uh, associate's degree, sociology, uh, while I was inside, uh, you know, which helped me get the opportunities that I did have. I'm heavily tatted from head to toe, you know, so I was stigmatized with you know, people looking at me in that in that world where I had weekly meetings with plant managers, and engineers, and they're like, yeah, here I am, heavily tattooed, <laughs> you know, holding down a skilled trade job. I dealt with explosive materials. And they're like, man, where did this guy come from? You know, and uh, I was tested on those aspects as well. You know, and I literally had conversations with the plant managers where, you know, I come from the same place. You came from the womb, my mother's womb, you know, <laughs> yeah. and I put my pants on as a man the same way you do. And I hold my job down. And you know what? On my watch, you know, I, I dotted my I's, crossed my T's, and I adjusted into a life blessed with the opportunity I got to excel and, and continue forward productively. Uh, I had three little boys since I've been home. I raised my children. I have four adults. That are all successful kids, got themselves to college, made great careers. I've been blessed, humbled, man. Um, I lead a productive, good life, live in a middle class subdivision, great area. You know, my kids are all good. I go to work. Um, That's what's up, man. Well, you're the perfect. When I want to bring a, someone on this channel, you're like, you know, you're that guy because what, you know, what I want to do with this channel is show people that people like us can change and we can be right. productive members of society. Everybody's right. made mistakes in their life. You know, we just made some bigger ones, but that doesn't, right. that doesn't mean shit in the end. So That's I just wanted to thank you for coming on the channel, man, and sharing your story. You got quite the story. Um, and you know, who, who knows, maybe somebody young, gang banging right now is watching this and you know they can see like that's not the life that you want to lead forever and you can give that shit up and turn your life around so Definitely. salute to you man for for Thank making you, that brother. change and i uh, appreciate you coming on the channel man anytime brother i appreciate you definitely hope that my story will, will inspire you know at youth risk young adults to hold on to hope against all lies and adversity nothing is impossible out here to uh, overcome, prevail, succeed. Um, it's all the mind over matter, you That's know, and, uh, and I, uh, I pray for us all in the world. We're in critical times. I appreciate the opportunity to come on here and share part of my story, true life. Yep. Uh, and I, I refuse to become institutionalized. I refuse to lose on, on others' terms. I strive to be all I can be. Uh, I, treat, I teach my children the same thing, family man, a humble, you just want a simple life, and I've made that possible and blessed and hope that uh, wherever I can pay it forward, I do. And uh, likewise, brothers, you know, we, we uh, definitely uh, can show the world that it's not impossible to change. So if you guys haven't, I uh, hope you enjoyed this interview. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and that like button on the way out. And with that, it's DOC TV, and we're out.